Today I am going to talk to y'all about uh, video synthesis, video games, and psychedelic experiences and kind of the links between these. Um, and in the process I'm going to talk about sort of my philosophy of uh, design, uh, design both from a low level and from a high level perspective. Cool. Hi, everybody. Great to see a nice chat crowd happening here. Ha, 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 ha. Um, yeah, and don't forget, always refresh your window constantly. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the, the audience for this is going to be both people who design systems at very low levels, uh, and that's like tool makers, uh, software designers, um, Whatnot. I guess that's, you know, software designers or tool makers. <laughs> um, and also people who design systems at higher levels. And that just literally means that's all of us who make video art and audio art in general. Because when you design, when you're making a patch on your analog system, when you're building something in Hydra, you are designing, you're, you're basically doing the same thing but with a different set of uh, primitives. Um, but it's still kind of the same philosophical approach that you have in both both sides. So what you have is sort of a set of primitives, um, and the primitives can be like video oscillators, they can be, um, uh, what do you call it, they can be uh, like a camera and a mixer, it can be like a bunch of glitch machines, it can be uh, just like a bunch of audio signals that you're like plugging into video things somehow. Um, or like ways you can manipulate color, whatever, and that's like a higher level set of primitives, and then at a lower level, um, your set of primitives is more like, so I'm programming in C++, so I have these kind of data types to work with, or I'm designing an analog system, so my primitives are basically like, what kind of like physical materials can I use to make things? And you find that both systems have sort of inherent limitations. At the top level, the high level, you have the limitations that are built into it by the designers. And at the low level, the limitations are, generally speaking, more sort of based on, like, the physical limitations of reality. Like, you're not going to, like, there, there's only a certain speed you can make oscillators go before they'll just melt, you know? Um, there's only so much, like, there, there, there's limits to how much memory you can use in uh, uh, digital computer situations. Like, you can't just have, you know, 400 gigabytes of, like, RAM to handle. Um, that's just, that's just, like, uh, uh, not logistic. <laughs> but, yeah, basically, um... The, 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 the goal of the low-level designers is to make sort of a finished system that is clearly designed for people to use where you can just sort of intuitively learn um, your system without needing to know any of the technical detail. Like if you're working in the low level, you'll need to understand like electrical engineering, DSP, ADCs, DACs, all that kind of biz. And if you're working at the high level, ideally, if you're working with a well-designed system, all you have to do is just look at an interface and clearly see, oh, okay, so if I do this, like, something happens. If I move this button, obviously, like, uh, these oscillators are going to, like, change their width and size. If I move this button, it changes an angle. If I move this button, it makes things bend. Um, so, I mean, I'm definitely, if you used any of my things, you know that the interface design is sort of bad. <laughs> it's confusing, but at a bare minimum, I try to make sure that whenever you move something, like, you get an immediate video response. Like, for, for there, there's just sort of like a one-to-one, -one, so you basically, like, teach yourself how to play the instrument by playing the instrument. And this is sort of, uh, 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 to start to tie in with video games, uh, if you look at how, like, I'll be using a lot of references to, like, um, I don't know, probably, like, Super Mario Brothers or something, or Sonic the Hedgehog, or just kind of shit that I feel like maybe there's, like, some sort of, like, cross-generational awareness of these, these kind of games, basically, because I would like this to be appealing to, like, people maybe in their 50s all the way down to teenagers. I realize talking about Super Mario Brothers is not really gonna, like, endear me to a lot of teenagers, but... Uh, the, the information is out there. <laughs> I, I'm doing what I can. 
Uh, but if you look at a game like the original Super Mario Brothers, um, the game pretty much teaches you how to play it while you're playing it. There's that little like demo screen that boots up, shows the little character running, they jump, they hit something, they hit a block, something comes out, they jump on the little uh, Goomba thing, and they kill it. So like basically just like looking at the game for five seconds teaches you the basic things that you can do in that game. Um, and, oh yeah, I do want to qualify what I'm going to say in this, this talk as well, too, because um, I'm not an expert in really, like, video game, game design. I'm honestly not really an expert in, like, video synthesis or psychedelic experiences and the sort of traditional idea of what an expert is, which is someone who, like, studies a lot of things, does, like, academic research, writes books, and, like, knows, like, a lot of, like important lingo and has like published papers and all that kind of shit uh so i don't know what people usually use to like talk about these things every like like all of where i'm coming from and understanding this is just sort of like first principles kind of thing and first principles means um it's a thing that like mathematicians like to do and that everybody else in academia makes fun of mathematicians for it's where you sort of like look at a problem and then you try to reduce it to the simplest like a very very simple set of rules that you can extrapolate everything else from um if anybody can remember from like a high school geometry class this is probably like the most uh um <clears throat> The, 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 the most blatant sort of like familiarity uh, anybody in Western culture might have with this sort of thing where like in geometry you learn basically like you, you're learning Euclidean uh, 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 sort of like plain geometry and you start off with just a list of like five rules these are just givens and you have like another five postulates which is how to deal with parallel lines and stuff and then literally everything else that you learn in that class you don't need to memorize anything else in that class because everything comes down to dials down to just that set of like 10 statements that are like the bare bones that everything else is built out of. And uh, uh, mathematicians like this kind of stuff because it means you don't have to memorize anything. Uh, well, you have to memorize maybe a couple of things, but everything else is just sort of like figuring out how do you like reason your way upward from things. So that's sort of my approach to this. It's sort of my approach to everything. Uh, it's basically how I learn. I try to like think about what is the simplest things that are uh, available to me and uh, just sort of like start from there and see what it can build up. Because um, then I don't have to learn very much because I'm, you know, honestly, I'm kind of lazy. Uh, I'm stoned all the time. Uh, I don't drink coffee anymore. So I just don't have that much energy for things. Um, so try to like learn as little as possible and to like sort of like use use this sort of like first principles things to kind of like build up from there. <laughs> but yeah, like I was saying before about video games, video games, like a well-designed video game teaches you its set of first principles like pretty much immediately by playing the game. Ideally not through like characters who like little penguins who jump up and down and like shriek things at you or little fairies on your shoulder that like um, spout canned uh, 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 voice recordings at you, but like through literally just playing the game. You just like physically interact with something, hit some buttons, do this thing, and then you learn what your sort of set of primitives are. So in Mario, your set of primitives are running and jumping. That's pretty much all you can do. And then you learn pretty quickly if you run and then you jump, you jump higher and farther. Uh, if you jump on top of uh, some sort of an enemy, you'll jump a little bit higher than you did before. So you start off with these primitives of running and jumping, and then by the end of the game, you've built up this sort of like giant, uh, 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 sort of like a giant set of tricks and, and larger sets of patches that you can have to get more things done because each level sort of builds up on the next. Like you, you, you you'll, they'll teach you like, oh, maybe you swim in this one, but basically swimming is just a different kind of running. And maybe you don't have any, you, you, maybe all you have to do is like jump and bounce off of things in this one level. But it's sort of like a, 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 the video game should always be teaching you something about how to play the video game. And this is, in my opinion, um, a really, really great way for uh, tool makers and designers to think about how they make their system. Is that the system itself and interacting with the system, uh, it should be fun. It should 
do something cool right off the start and everything that you're doing should be able to like should be teaching you how to build things and make them go farther and farther. <clears throat> um, I've also talked about this being about psychedelic experiences and I want to talk a little bit about what does psychedelic mean in this context. So for most people would think of psychedelic experiences as like just like a drug that you take and then you're like, whoa, I did a drug. Uh, this is crazy. What a psychedelic time I'm having. Um, but I want to be a little bit more uh, sort of, what do you call it, uh, rigorous about what that means. And this is a definition that probably won't hold up for very long, but we'll start off with this definition right now. So let's say there's all these things that you expect your senses to tell you about the outside world. And this is just sort of like your general preconception of what sort of information you're getting from reality. And um, a psychedelic experience is one in which uh, you're reacting to stimuli that don't really fully exist in the outside world. So the, the, the most obvious one to say is that when you do a lot of hallucinogenics and you close your eyes and you see like patterns and stuff, this is stimuli that is not coming from the outside world directly. It's being created in your mind, but it's sort of being fed into your perceptual system as though it was coming from empirical reality. So this is a psychedelic experience. A psychedelic experience is one in which your perception is being sort of hijacked by something, whether inadvertently or advertently. Um, and this ties in with a video game in that when you play a video game, you are fundamentally having a psychedelic experience because you sort of project an element of your consciousness into the avatar, whatever sort of avatar you have that you're playing with, and you react to the stimulus in that environment as though it was sort of like real life things. Even though like the video game is also like giving you light and sound that comes from like the empirical real world that you're around, you're not treating the light and sound as though, you don't treat the light that you're receiving from a video game screen as though it's sort of like just like a flat two-dimensional plane that you're inter interacting with. You treat it as though it's sort of like taking over like the rest of I, I like like a lot of people like like to be really really in close so you don't see anything in your peripherals other than like things or like we have VR where the whole thing can like close your eyes off uh, you enter into this sort of um, trance state where you project yourself into this zone and treat this environment this contrived virtual environment as the one that you are primarily reacting to sort of much in the same way as when you look at an LCD screen you don't see every single individual red, green, and blue pixel. You see a full image which is outputted, and you perceive that gestalt image as one sort of singular thing. Uh, much the same way you look when you engage with a video game, you are taking in the sound and the um, visual cues, and occasionally like a vibration cue or whatever the heck else you could get, um, as being sort of like this, this virtual reality which you are like conceding to like, you're consensually like allowing yourself to hallucinate that this is a sort of a primary set of stimuluses. So think about that for a second and let's think about how this sort of applies to video synthesis and how we engage with video and for many of us who do video and audio at the same time, how we're sort of engaging in world building uh, with this kind of a thing. Um, also, yeah, I'm not positive how long this is going to go. I probably have way too much things to say here for this talk. So if someone can just give me a little like kick in the butt when it's like five minutes left, I, I, want, I just want to, want to skip to my closing notes so I get to those before anything else. Um, but yeah, uh, where was I at? Psychedelic experiences, video games, putting yourself in a world. Um, so when we think about how you sort of get this feedback from video games where you press a button and the character jumps and you feel like you're jumping in a way, like you project yourself into this world. Um, we get this in very different ways. It happens in sort of a different set of, of, of inputs, but we can get pretty similar things happening in um, video synthesis as well. And for one example, like the sort of simplest way to think about it is that 
So I can just put myself into the video waves thing here, and then as soon as I allow in some sort of feedbacky things to happen, um, basically I am sort of controlling the, the, the feedback. I'm controlling the video with my gestures. So I can do all of this kind of stuff, and I can change the parameters with my little mouse clicker over here, and basically I'm like, like, it's not quite the same level of projection because I don't have like so much intuitive physical control over things, but it's another way to sort of put myself, I'm putting a little piece of myself into this patch and I'm controlling it with my physical reality. So this is sort of like the, the uh, very like blatant, obvious, and easy way to like sort of put yourself into these worlds, but most of the time we don't really have a camera pointed at our faces while we're doing video things. I've noticed I do this all the time because I'm lazy and it's an easy way to get a video source into my video things, but I've noticed this is not like generally how people like uh, uh, typically do their video stuff. <clears throat> they usually keep their faces out. They're usually also not talking the whole time. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but if you think about just these sort of like uh, 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 oscillators, like we're able to sort of create these worlds. We're designing like a system that is responding to us. And <clears throat> intuitively, as we move these things and they react to us, they become an extension of our nervous system and they become, and this, this virtual world we create uh, sort of starts to like encompass uh, uh, a large part of like our, our reality, a virtual reality that we're making at this moment. Something I did want to talk about, which was kind of like amusing, I don't know if it makes any sense to talk about it in this context, but I'm going to anyway. Um, there's a video game uh, called Yoshi's Island uh, for the Super Nintendo, for Game Boy Advance, and a bunch of other things. Uh, if anyone is not familiar with it, you can just, if you want to see what I'm talking about for this talk, you can just look up Yoshi's Island Drug Level, and you'll see a bunch of things pop up on YouTube. Uh, but it's this interesting thing where, so you're playing, uh, at this point in the game, if you're playing the game, you've played it for maybe about an hour or so, you've gotten like a good handle on like the primitives of this game, and then you get to this one level where you're jumping around, you're bouncing around, and you hit these cloud things, and all of a sudden, the music goes super wonky, the visuals start to like meld up and down, and basically your character in the game, and it's pretty obvious it's your character in the game, it's not a part of the game environment, is like having some sort of a like uh, hallucinogenic experience. Like the background warps, the music warps, like every bit of input you're getting from the game is like, oh, whoa, things are going crazy here. Uh, which sort of, and it, it has like an interesting effect on your own brain while you're doing it because you've come to like accept the set of rules as being like, this is how this game is going to work. This is, this is the world I'm in. And then all of a sudden you're just like, oh, I bumped up against this little like weird cloudy thing and I'm like tripping my balls off now. And it's kind of like an amusing thing to notice inside of you how your virtual character is having a psychedelic experience inside of the psychedelic experience and how it creates a feeling inside of you that is like, oh, whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm having this sort of like weird experience by proxy by proxy, but it feels like there's something happening to me as well. Uh, and it sort of made me think about uh, what you can do, like, uh, it'd be interesting if there was a video game that was based entirely around that. And it can be like very heavily like feedback and like oscillator based. But say you just start out with a really simple like environment. You just move things around. You just like obstacles. You could just say for for the shits and giggles, let's just say it's like Katamari, and you roll your ball around and you pick up little like random tiny obstacles in your environment. And as soon as you pick up a certain amount of obstacles in your environment, the entire like physical reality changes a bit. And the, 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 the way that you physically interact changes and your visuals change. It adds, like, a bunch of feedback to everything, and all of a sudden you've, like, leveled up. So, like, leveling up in progress in this video game could be the same thing as, like, building a visual patch. Um, yeah, uh, uh, I just wanted to talk about that because sometimes it's helpful for me to talk about my ideas and see how they sound. If it sounds really stupid, then I'll just forget about it. <laughs> Uh, but I also wanted to sort of shoehorn a recommendation to check out uh, 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 
Alan Riley, the artist, uh, has made uh, an arcade machine called Video Freak, which is based off of, it's like a little, like, like a scrolling shooter game, which runs off of a Videonics MX Pro and an Archer video enhancer inside of the cabinet, so it's a little video game, which the different things that you hit and press do different, like, video feedback things, and it's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I hope nobody was expecting me to have, like, a linear and cohesive talk for this. I'm just going to be, like, rambling about things, and, like, some of them will, like, make a lot of sense together, and some of them will just kind of, like, be like, <laughs> what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> but, yeah, to sort of bring this into how this works with, like, uh, psychedelic experiences, um... In a psychedelic experience, you don't have this sort of formal, unless, if you've done it via drugs, you don't have a formal, sort of formal control over things the same way you do over a video synthesizer or over a video game. If you've done it via meditation or some sort of magical or occult type uh, 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 mental processes, then you do actually get a lot more control over, like, the, the, the kind of, like, scenarios and the effects that you have. Um, but in a, in a very small way, you can kind of, like, use your attention you can use your like your brain uh the, the what you're paying attention to to alter things a very simple trip a very simple trick you can try next time that you trip uh if you're had if you, if you enjoy taking acid or mushrooms or dmt or whatever to have you is to like do this sort of a thing when you're like you put your hand in front of something where it's very like a uh, 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 stark contrast against Start moving your hand around and like try to focus on the trails as much as possible. And you'll notice that by focusing on the trails, you bring them out more. And the more you sort of like look at your trails and the more you like pay attention to them, the stronger they get. And then as you start to move around and move your vision around more, you'll notice that just like the sort of paying attention has has affected your sort of entire like uh, 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 trip experience and that's I think one of the the most like useful lessons you can get from uh, like hardcore psychedelic experiences is that paying attention is very important because what you choose to interpret as important gets processed differently inside your brain and it happens with or without drugs happening at all it's just the drugs are just there to amplify things and make things sort of more obvious and simple uh, but if you sort of like like the 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 if you just sort of focus on like fractal patterns that you start to see and you notice you start to zoom in you get more of this so a big part of just like I think a decent philosophy for your life is just like pay attention to things <laughs> and and you can sort of like choose what you pay attention to and it vastly changes your perception your interaction with the world in general boop, bump, bump. so that's kind of the end of the first section I think. Um, I'm not sure how much time I have left here. Uh, anybody want to let me know in the chat when I'm supposed to be done um, so I can sort of edit this thing out uh, live? And I'll just sort of start to like goof, goof around a little bit with uh, the video while I figure out what I'm going to say next. But the next thing I would want to talk about is these sort of like world building concepts. And the world building concept is that of basically when you're designing video, when you're playing a video game, like how is the world around you being constructed? And I've sort of uh, turn this into like two sort of like poles and obviously these are like toy problems these are not like no games 100 percent fit into either of this sort of like dichotomy but it's really important to like place this sort of dichotomy out for discussion because um as always when you're trying to like abstractly understand something you don't understand the actual situations in the real world you understand these simple stupid made-up problems first and then when you understand the stupid simple made-up problems you can see how to apply them to actual problems that exist in the real world. But we can say that we have two types of, let's start from the video games first, and there's two sort of polar extremes of like a video game world. You can have a video game that's just a roller coaster, and you can have a video game that's a sandbox. So, halfway? Okay, dank. <clears throat> 
So if you have a video game that is a roller coaster, um, this means exactly what it sounds like. When you go on a roller coaster, you can't do shit. You strap yourself in and then you get taken for a ride, and the ride is 100% predetermined before you ever got on it. Nothing will, and if you, like, get off the roller coaster and decide you want to go back on the roller coaster again, you'll get 100% the exact same experience. Um, so, and then the other kind of world that you can have built is a sandbox. And a sandbox is one where you sit down in the sandbox and you say, well, you have a shovel, you have a bucket, and maybe you have some sort of an action figure. And these are the only tools that you have. And you have a bunch of sand and you can pile sand on top of more sand and make things. Um, and then you, the, 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 so, so the difference between then this one is that you, you basically could very, it's very unlikely that you would ever have the same experience twice in a sandbox. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it's just like there's too many things. There's too many particles of sand, and they like like while well, like two particles of sand interact with each other in a very simple way, one thousand particles of sand interact with one thousand other particles of sand in this sort of like nonlinear and chaotic way. So you'll never have a one hundred percent the exact same experience. So realistically speaking, there is no video game that is one hundred percent like a roller coaster. But some of them, but a lot of them have this sort of element. To, to, to have a video game that was a 100% roller coaster, we would actually be talking about sort of demo scene stuff. And if you don't know what demo scene means, um, I, I recommend looking into it. It's an interesting world. Uh, it sort of started with like uh, uh, amateur Commodore 64 designers, people who wanted to design games, but maybe they didn't have money or time to. So what they would do instead is they would design this sort of like five, ten minute demo experience that shows off what kind of graphics and what kind of sound and what kind of everything, like like a like a sizzle reel for like what they could program and what kind of experience you could have. And then they just like share that with people on the web. And uh, well, I guess it wasn't called the web back then. It was you know dial up or your your cradle modems and shit. You'd share it with people on BBSs and then you'd like download a demo and you'd run it to you and you'd be like, oh my god, that was that was a crazy experience. But it wasn't a video game. It was just basically it was an idea for a video game that was had like a hard coded stop and finish. And anytime you'd want to play it again, it would play the exact same thing. And demo scene is still it's still alive nowadays. There's uh most most people who who do demo scene things now are working in shaders. Like this is a pretty common thing you'll see is you'll have these sort of like live uh, uh, people will have like a fixed amount of time to sort of come up with like one shader that does some like crazy ass shit and you'll notice if you look at this kind of stuff a lot it really oftentimes does feel exactly like a roller coaster in terms of like what sort of like there's usually like a lot of tunnel things happening some sort of like implied movement some sort of kaleidoscope things turning all around and stuff um, but yeah, so a demo scene would be like the roller coaster, but um, a lot of video games, in fact, most video games in the history of video games have been sort of more roller coaster than sandbox in that there's sort of like this fixed pipeline of events that you have to go through. If you look at like a, a like a, a Final Fantasy game, like the old Final Fantasy games and most role-playing games in general, if you just subtract out the sort of like whatever kind of strategy combat en engine they've like contrived to like distract you from the fact that you're just like editing spreadsheets, um, the actual like way that the, 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 the games go is very much just a roller coaster. You don't really have that much choice. You have like a set beginning, a set end, and for the most part you have to do all these sort of linear steps in one in order. So you have some amount of uh, uh, agenda in that you get to like sort of like take place in a turn-based combat. You can make sort of decisions about what your character's name is, and you can like choose to like you know dick around and like not go on to your like next quest for a while. But it's still ultimately just like a roller coaster. Um, and most like platform games have like uh, some some element of this, but usually what happens like like what happened pretty early on with like platforming and action games, is that you the the the, the people who design the games 
usually wanted to give you some sort of an entertaining physics engine, like a pleasing physics engine to like give you some sort of like reason, like like a reasonable enjoyment of your like avatar's experience. So you look at something like Pac-Man physics, Pac-Man physics is just on and off. You move in one direction at the exact same speed and you can, if you just press the joystick the other way, you just move that way without any sort of like interference. You can just basically like, and if you stop, you just stop all of a sudden. I mean, you look at Super Mario Brothers, where you have inertia. You have this tiny amount of inertia that comes into play. If you're moving this way and you stop and try to move in the other direction, you're going to screech a little bit. Uh, the more you run, the faster you run, the higher you can jump. So you get this sort of, like, physics environment, which uh, the Sonic the Hedgehog games uh, sort of, like, took to another level where they sort of made just, like, the physics, like, the absurd, unreal physics, like, the main sort of appeal out of things. And they would usually give you these sort of like environments where you're supposed to be playing this roller coaster. You're just supposed to keep moving from left to right and keep killing things. And you like get to some like arbitrary ending point. Uh, but oftentimes players who play these games will just stop and be like, oh, I just want to like bounce up and down on this thing all the time because it's like really fun. Or I want to like spin around in this thing all the time because literally just this sort of like uh, 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 interacting with the physics and the environment is pleasurable and that's where like sort of like uh, a, a lot of sort of sandboxy things start to uh, come they're usually like an emergent process um uh i guess another sort of what i would say would be like the first real like real deal like sandbox game like video game is something which a lot of people might not even define as a video game or as video synthesis it would be uh john h conway's game of life so the Game of Life was this sort of like, uh, it wasn't even designed originally as a computer game. It was designed using like 20 Go boards and a fuck ton of Go pieces. Like people like set these up in like a, a college rec room and just like kept like playing with this stuff to like, um, what do you call it? <clears throat> to test out rule systems. Because they were, they, well, basically what Conway was trying to do was they studied cellular automata, um, uh, the, the sort of stuff that like von Neumann and uh, Stanislaw Ulam had, uh, had worked on and they thought it was a really interesting, they thought it was really cool, but they thought it was really cumbersome and bulky and like not fun to interact with. So um, John Conway is just sort of like a, a ridiculous, whimsical like uh, 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 character. They always tried to make things fun. So hence like that's why they turned it into a game not into like a universal like automata machine <laughs> um but their goal was to have a very simple set of rules that could do uh, uh that could that could sort of like have like uh lifelike qualities and they succeeded quite well uh they started it off they designed it as like just like a pen and paper kind of game uh but uh some computer programmers got a hold of this and sort of turned Game of Life into a, a computer program that you could play with. And in the process, uh, apparently, like, the legends is that, like, tens of thousands of dollars were wasted at universities, army bases, and everybody else who had access to, like, the whatever, like, I don't know, like, PDPs or whatever computers, like, most, most like, corporate, uh, uh, corporate and academic, like, rental things were having at the time, leaser things had. Uh, just like tens of thousands of dollars of hours were wasted on people just like setting up an initial condition for Game of Life and then seeing how it plays out. Uh, because Game of Life is actually barely even a video game, uh, but it's very much a sandbox in that you have this very simple set of rules. You can't change the rule system. It's a, it's a very simple cellular automata rule system for how like uh, squares go black or white in the next frame based upon the, the, the current state of any squares. Um, and then you, uh, the only thing you can do is set up the initial conditions. So you can basically go on and say, put something there, put in a black one there, put a black one there, and then let's hit play and see how it plays out. Uh, but yeah, this is to me, I think the sort of first real sandbox game and that there was no fixed goal. The only goal you have is one that you decide for yourself and that there was sort of, uh, uh just like like not truly an infinite but from like a logistical standpoint uh, a functionally infinite or like absurdly massive countable set of like states 
that you could be in at any point. So I think these are the two like defining aspects of a sandbox is just like massive set of outcomes and that you like, <clears throat> what was the other one I said? <laughs> well, I just said it like two minutes, or not two minutes. I said it 45 seconds ago. You can rewind it. Rewind it and hear what I said. <laughs> um, but yeah, if we sort of abstract these ideas to synthesis, where do we come? So for like a pure roller coaster device, Pure roller coaster devices don't really exist that much for video synthesis at this point. I would say the only things that really come close would be like the Critter and Guitari kind of machines. And those are ones, um, those are the ones that have like a very sort of like, there's, there's a rigid set of like what you can do with it. Um, there's sort of these pre-baked, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, preset machines. It's like the, the synthesizers where you don't actually get to do synthesis. You just have a bunch of presets that you can do like tiny little tweaks with. Uh, but within those tweaks, you can still like do a lot and you can, and, like a lot of people have a good time with this. Uh, but you don't really get this sort of like world building out of it. You get, what you get uh, is at the cost of having a world building is you get to like a plug and play immediate gratification kind of experience. And that's, that's the roller coaster is the first time you do it, uh, you don't have to put any sort of effort into learning anything. You can just strap yourself in and you have a good time. Um, so I'm not saying these as like judgmental approaches to anything. Like there's pros and cons to both of these. Uh, uh, cause like a pure sandbox, like game of life, is just literally just not appealing to so many people because there's like, it's just like, there's no predefined goals for you. There's no presets for you to like start off and like know exactly what you're doing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of more for the, the pure sandboxes for those people who are entirely self-motivated by like, I want to see what happens. I need to explore this. And, oh yeah, I'm familiar with Greg Egan. <laughs> um... <clears throat> Try not to pay attention to... Um, you can write your own patches for the Critter and Gachari things, but uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not exactly like... Um, like, once you're in there, it's not like you like uh, can do... Like, like, build something from scratch so much. You're sort of working within, like, the frameworks of, like, what they have. Uh, I think so. Uh, but yeah, you don't really have like the full environment. It's more like like uh, 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 like if I designed a processing sketch that lets you only do sort of one thing. Like you still have processing. Like if you press play on my processing sketch and you you get this roller coaster experience, and then you stop and you say, well, what else can you do? Well, you can also write your own thing in processing. So it's not quite a synthesis system. It just offers you the way to sort of use that box to design your own synthesis system, but within pure data, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, oh yeah, or Python or whatever. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's just offering access to the low level things, I guess. I don't really have that much experience with them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's not so many like fully baked preset machines in video. Um, well, I guess also if you think about like Resolume and that kind of thing, like those are a lot of preset boxes too, where they just sort of have like these like saved hardwired functional things that you can do, which you don't have like that much tweak over, but you can usually like plug LFOs into. Um, <clears throat> But most of the sandbox, most of the, the, the video synthesis environments are sandboxes. You go all the way back to the, the, the Sandine, which is the original Sandine box uh, uh, environment. That is a joke, by the way. I'm pausing for laughter <laughs> in a live stream where I can't hear any response, and there's probably a good 10 to 40 seconds of delay <laughs> before anyone in the chat hears this. <laughs> Okay, I wrote that one down, and I wrote pause for laughter, too. Um, so the Sandine would be like kind of like one of the original like massive sandbox kind of video video processing environments. Hydra, vSynth, like any sort of analog modular system or any kind of like large, any, any sort of system with like cameras and mixers, just anything with like enough moving parts. And I think enough moving parts, you really only need two or three moving parts in a video system to really get like a really open environment. Um, so most systems are sandboxes and there's sort of very little roller coaster involved in them. 
and I'm sort of interested in, I like the sandbox idea of basically like making things open, as open as possible, but in terms of interface design and interaction design, it's nice to involve some kind of the roller coaster aspect into that, where you just are sort of like inevitably led down a path. Like for most people using the sort of like digital feedback things, like the first path you go down is probably something pretty similar to this one, where you just like have a video input and you just want to like wave your hands around it or wave some live video around it and you like watch and see what happens with the feedback and see what happens when you mess around with color and everything. Um, and I'm just going to like sort of collect myself here for a moment. But yeah, sandbox games are also sort of like, that's kind of one of the more dominant sort of video game like uh, 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 paradigms right now. There's Murder Tag, which is probably the most like dominant video game paradigm still, I'm guessing. I don't really know, uh, but it's a reasonable guess because uh, uh, Tag is a very fun game and like uh, pretending and Americans like to inflict pretend violence upon one another so murder tag definitely a popular video game environment but then like minecraft is sort of like the ultimate sandbox thing and then starting from like grand theft auto on most of these linear narrative games give you some kind of like at least like the the, the veneer of a sandbox to play in in terms of just having a bunch of like silly things you can always do with your environment that are entertaining whether or not you're like propelling a plot or like achieving anything of like at, at, at any point. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, from a design aspect, um, so if you're putting together systems like this, there's sort of interesting like costs to think about designing a roller coaster and designing a sandbox. Um, so this is where I do a little bit of a. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of a digression into computational complexity. Um, you can't listen to me talk for more than 30 minutes without some math being involved. Um, but uh, So computational complexity, it doesn't have anything to do with computers. So let's first off say what we mean by computation is this abstract idea of like how do you sort of like basically like how do you achieve something. Or how, how is anything like, how, how is like some sort of algorithm being realized? Uh, uh, the, the algorithm could be a recipe. So we could talk about the, the complexity of just like my making a cake recipe. And we'd want to think about sort of two sort of like uh, costs. One cost is in how much space, as in, um, so I want to make 50 dumplings from scratch because it's New Year's. So uh, uh, do I have enough space in my kitchen to actually make 50 dumplings? Maybe I don't. Maybe I need to scale this down and I say I make one batch of 20 dumplings then make another batch of 20 dumplings. Uh, so this is sort of like in, in, uh, if we're talking about like designing an analog circuit, the space thing would kind of match up with how much physical like resources do you have to work with? Like your physical limits are going to be decided by like basically how many, usually how many oscillators do you have and how are you going to combine your oscillators with like integrators or adders or logic or whatnot. So the physical limitations are there in like what do you have access to and also the physical limitations are there in terms of reality is not going to let you have something oscillate at a certain speed for too long without it just melting. So there's also like entropy to deal with. Um, and entropy both in the physical heat um, aspect and in the, the abstract like informational communication concept is very strongly tied into this idea of like computation and computational cost and complexity because it does seem the more that you think about it and the more that you like work on sort of computational complexity problems these do seem like these are ideas that are very strongly tied into physics in that there may very well be physical, I mean, not may, there almost certainly are physical limitations of what kind of computation you can do in this universe. Uh, because the only computation you can do is stuff using physical uh, material from this universe. So the more we understand about the physical properties of matter in the universe, the more we understand about like computation and what sort of things you can and cannot do in computation. 
Uh, but because it's such a new study, it's really, really friggin' hard to prove anything in it. So a lot of a lot of stuff gets to be conjectured. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot of conjecture sphere at the moment. Um, but yeah, the other cost, so not just space, but also um, how long is it going to take me to make these dumplings? Just how, And you can usually just think about that as like, how many steps do you have? You know, step one, make the dough. Step two, make the filling. Step three fold every dumpling together, step four, put them in the steamer. Um, so we have this time cost. So there's space cost and then there's time cost. And these are both of the things you really need to think about in terms of like designing things is like what sort of algorithms are you working with and how do they use time and space? Um, and we all know that space and time are the same thing, sort of, in, in relativistic terms. Uh, but there's there's um, functional limits in like how you can like realistically achieve things in both of these. So sort of even though like if we're talking about just plain old Turing machines, space and time, p space and p time, uh, sort of have these this relationship in that as long as you just have enough time, you don't need any space at all. Uh, but because we're talking about practically designing things here, let's think about space and time as being uh, somewhat separate here for the moment. <clears throat> so if we look at the roller coaster, there's let's let's think about just like the dumbest, and most simple and obvious ways to implement a roller coaster, and the dumbest and simplest and most obvious way is to implement a sandbox. So, roller coaster, the simplest way to implement that is just literally like I hard code every single event one by one, just in order. Um, to write like some really dumb pseudo code, I could say, okay, first animation of you getting onto and sitting down on the roller coaster. Next animation of you going forward and zooming around and things swoop around and all that shit happens and you hear people screaming and you see the ground underneath you and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, just literally just writing every single event out in order. And the cost of that in space is just pretty much what you've essentially done is you've made an uncompressed video. Uh, you have like gone down to like the low level and you made an uncompressed video that just unfolds as you play. And uncompressed video, as I'm sure many of us know, like fully 100% uncompressed video is friggin' huge and it scales horribly. <laughs> um, it's, it's because video is like multi-dimensional, uh, pretty much any sort of uncompressed video is going to scale like in a way you don't you just don't want to deal with at all. So um, the roller coaster is sort of expensive. It's expensive in one way, but you also don't need the, the, the other thing is that you don't need to know anything about your system. You don't need a system at all. You can just simply like say this happens, this happens and this happens. Um, if I wanted to make an analog roller coaster thing, this would be stupid, and I'm not going to do this. Um, but you could just set up a system of timed logic switches on a system of analog oscillators locked into some sort of a pattern. And you could just basically hit one button that says start, and then you'd have your little timed logic switches that would just say, at this time, this oscillator gets triggered, this goes up. So you can make your sort of analog oscillator uh, a roller coaster ride. Uh, but once again, you can see that this is going to scale pretty terribly in terms of space because you sort of you can't reuse oscillators for anything. Everything only does one thing, and then once it's done, then it's over. You have another thing going on. Um, so yeah, I'm guessing I only have like 15 minutes left, 10 minutes left, five minutes left. Um, I'm gonna try to like jet through things. I want to get to my closing thoughts as soon as possible. <laughs> Uh, make sure I get to my closing thoughts. On the other hand, for a sandbox, um, a sandbox, you really, your limits are basically like you program in a set of primitives and you program in a set of rules for how these primitives interact. In Game of Life, the primitives are just black square, white square. And the rules for how they interact is just this table of you look around in your neighborhood and Perfect. Ten minutes left is perfect. You look around in your neighborhood, and that's how you construct your next frame. Uh, so the game of life is also a really useful sort of uh, 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 um, 
metaphor to use for modern, especially modern, like, uh, digital programming things, and that Game of Life was not a serial, um, it, 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 was, it was a parallel sort of programmed thing. Not that they had parallel programming at the time, not that the Game of Life could take advantage of any kind of parallelism, really, at the time, uh, but the sort of theoretical, um, what do you call it, uh, 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 the way in which it seems like, like it operates is that sort of each pixel, every single pixel on the screen, decides at the same time what it will be in the next frame. So this is a parallelism which... Um, means that sort of when you sort of abstract this concept over to how a shader works uh, in, in GL language, that's exactly how, how like you have to program shaders. You have to program them in parallel because sort of every single little core on your GPU executes once per pixel on the screen and uh, it can't really get like serial information the way that like you get in a, a, a traditional kinds of programming. Um, and in analog, I think you're pretty much locked into serial multiplexed signals. Um, I'm 95% sure that you have to do that. I'm not positive, though. There may be some way out of uh, serial uh, programming in an analog realm, but I think you would need digital controllers at least to sort of like start off if that makes sense, and you would need to be working with a non-multiplexed signal as well. So I'm not sure what you could possibly gain by having a parallel programmed analog uh, video device, and also you might need a fundamentally different kind of display to do things. You may, maybe there's some sort of way to like leverage like OLEDs to work with um, uh, some sort of like parallel analog generated system, but as most things, analog um, when we're talking about analog video, analog video scales pretty terribly to higher resolutions and it's quite expensive. So it's definitely like very useful to at least have like a, a sort of testing ground in a digital environment to work with things. Um, even if you're working in analog as your end goal, it's useful to be able to sort of like prototype and test things out in, in a somewhat digital environment to save time and to save money and to, uh, you know, not maybe you make your workshop a little cooler in the long run too if you're not running all these really high speed like all soldiers all in the ding dang time <laughs> um, I'm not sure if I came to any sort of like conclusions there if my goal was ever to come to a conclusion but I do have closing thoughts so I can at least say the closing thoughts um, I missed a bunch of stuff on psychedelic experiences which I wanted to talk more about but maybe I'll turn this into an article or do like a more uh, rigorously edited and prepared version of this talk at some point in the future. Um, but if you think about how you interact with reality in general, um, it's, it's simultaneously a cliche and also really important to realize that like hallucination describes how you interact with reality in general. Because we don't, we, we take in this sort of uh, sensory information from the outside world. We take in light spectrum from our eyes. We take in pressure waves from another spectrum in our ears. Uh, we absorb chemicals into our tongues and our nose. We uh, have little gyroscopes that tell us where our balance is. We have kinesthesia, which tells us where our body is at. So we're getting all of this information from the outside world. We're not processing this as raw information. What our brain does for us, thankfully, is it combines all of the sensory uh, information into a cohesive sort of narrative, like a linear narrative that we can engage with in a meaningful and useful manner. So in a very, very real way, all reality is constructed and all reality is hallucination. Like, or reality, it's not in terms of, like, it's not like a drug or, like, a meditation or a magic that made it, uh, but it is sort of like it's made out of the same things. There's that one sort of cornball theory that says there's all this DMT that your brain produces all the time. An important part of your natural brain DMT is that it's helping you construct this sort of, like, linear narrative out of, uh, um, out of all this, like, raw information that you get. Um... So, basically, um, 
and we use all these models in our head that are stored up for like processing things. So I have a model for a dog, so I can look at all kinds of different shaped things and I still see them all as dog. I have a model that says this is close to me and this is far away, so I can perceive uh, um, like perspective. I can see like where I am in a three-dimensional space, even though I'm only seeing a two-dimensional image. I have a model for stairs, so I can look at stairs and not just see a bunch of lines, concentric lines. Uh, I see an actual thing that I can climb. Um, and all of these things, understanding all of these things and how we're sort of already having like a hallucinatory like psychedelic experience to begin with, um, we can use this as video artists and we can use what we sort of learn from like uh, projecting our avatars into video game worlds to design these sort of like more powerful, cohesive, and just like incredibly like meaningful experiences for ourselves and for others. Uh, I think that was the goal of what I was to say is just understanding this philosophy and paying attention to things around you and seeing the links between them uh, uh, is rewarding and it's fun. And the more you can develop your art and the more you can develop your tools, the more you are able to communicate in this sort of like uh, uh, low level and very effective manner with other people, your philosophies. Uh, because I don't know if you have noticed this yet, but everyone who's using my stuff, all the software that I make and everything, like I am communicating with you a good deal about my philosophy uh, and how I interact with the world and how I interact with life and how I interact with reality. And it's all sort of distilled in a very real way into these uh, things that I make. Um, but yeah, I think I have to use the bathroom now, so I'm going to switch this over and say thanks a lot, Ed. Thanks a lot, Jake. Thanks a lot, Gilbert. Thanks a lot, Tim, Paloma, everybody else who helped make all of these things possible. You should all give them another giant round of applause in the chat room for all of the logistical nightmares that I'm <laughs> making uh, 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 an amazing uh, set of uh, talks and performances like this entails. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye. Have fun.